Good evening, everyone. If we could encourage everyone who's coming in the door to kindly take their seats, we're about to get started. I know it's a treat to have a lecture in Marble House. It was a lot to see, but we invite you to join us afterwards for the reception. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Welcome to Marble House. My name is Leslie Jones. I'm the Director of Museum Affairs and Chief Curator at the Preservation Society. And it is my honor to welcome you to our first lecture of the winter 2023 season. We are grateful for all of you being here this evening. We could not put on these lecture uh, programs without your support. So thank you, those who are both in attendance and our friends on Zoom. I hope I'm at the right camera. Hello, Zoom people. Uh, tonight's lecture uh, is welcoming very special guests, our museum colleagues from the Lindhurst Mansion, the Hudson River Museum, and the Hart Cluett Museum. Uh, we have some of their colleagues who are joining us also on Zoom, so welcome and here in person. So thank you for being with us and making the trip. Uh, we would also encourage you to save the date for our next lecture, which is February 9th, Thursday again at 6 p.m. It's titled Fashioning America, African-American Designers and Dressmakers, and we'll be welcoming Teresa Guzman-Stokes, Executive Director of the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, who will present the life and history of dressmaker Mary Dickerson, who owned and uh, excuse me, who owned a fashionable dressmaking establishment located off Bellevue Avenue, and also established the first federation of African American women's clubs in Rhode Island. She will be joined by Elaine Nichols, who is the supervisory curator of culture at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And our friend Elaine will be discussing the life and work of Anne Lowe. Anne Lowe was a prolific fashion designer and was most known for the uh, both bridal dress and bridal party dresses she designed for the Newport wedding of Jacqueline Bouvier and John F. Kennedy in 1953. So that'll be a really wonderful lecture. Tonight, um, we are coming together to discuss HBO's The Gilded Age, which I'm sure all of you have tuned in for season one. We're looking forward to season two. Uh, it was filmed here at Preservation Society Properties and also at our colleagues' properties of Lindhurst, the Hudson River Museum's Glenview Mansion, and throughout the city of Troy, New York. Our panelists will be sharing what makes their property special, along with the characteristics of their sites and landscapes. And we'll also be discussing how HBO's The Gilded Age has impacted period houses and properties, which is in a, in a great way, actually, if you, if you think about it. Um, we'll be exploring what filming for the series means for these historic places and how it's helped bring the past to life. So a few housekeeping notes. We will be having a Q&A session following uh, the end of our panel. Uh, we welcome everyone here in the audience in person will, uh, to raise their hand. Uh, our lovely friend Claire Barneywalt, my colleague, will be running around with a microphone, so please wait until she gives you that microphone. Uh, for our friends on Zoom, we're sorry we can't answer your questions this evening, but if you have any existing questions, please feel free to contact the Preservation Society and we can direct those to the appropriate people. So before I introduce uh, our speakers who will be giving brief presentations themselves, followed by a discussion, I'm just going to give you a bit of a, a background of how filming affected the Preservation Society and our various properties. So we were contacted in 2018, many years before production began, uh, about an idea for a Julian Fellows drama that was focused on the American Gilded Age. Now this was with an entirely different network even before HBO had brought it on to their programming. And through the various years of discussions, through COVID uh, being a huge problem with uh, production beginning, uh, we were finally able to engage in this partnership and since the Preservation Society collectively is known as one of the largest collections of American Gilded Age collections, um, we were very excited to bring uh, both the cast and the crew to Newport. And our houses became a central part of storytelling in many ways, one in the branding itself. So this is what you're seeing on the screen is the ballroom ceiling of Rosecliff. And here it is uh, reimagined in a very similar fashion as part of the opening credits for the show itself. Uh, also, if you look towards the bottom and the top of the screen in the center, you'll see where it says the Gilded Age in a sort of faux carved um, uh, motif here. There's also uh, the exact copying of the various Julelard designed motifs that are found on the Rosecliff ceiling. So we made our way even into the branding of the show, which was a high compliment. Uh, we also had many of our historical characters 
and their personalities used as a part of the fictional characters. As you'll see here, our own Alva Vanderbilt Belmont of Marble House was used as an inspiration for Bertha Russell uh, by Julian Fellows. And then of course our own properties were used as the backdrops for many of the show's iconic season one uh, scenes. And this is the Breakers Ballroom. And our work as stewards of these important buildings was very hands-on, both in the preparation as well as the production and the post-production. Our special events teams, properties, curatorial, conservation and collections teams prepared and protected every inch of each house involved. And in production, uh, involved in pre and post production. So they not only showed their best, but also remained their best, even when not everybody felt their best. <laughs> uh, the work outside was also as important as the work inside. This is outside of the Breakers Ballroom, preparing um, the the night effects as needed for Gladys Russell's debut ball. And this was to make what's on the left look as good as it was actually in production on the right. We were fortunate to also interact with truly talented individuals, including cast members. And here our very own celebrity, Mark Malkovich, who's a part of our special events team, uh, is speaking with Christine Baranski, also known as Agnes Van Rijn. Um, and he was providing her a little small history lesson and to quote Mark, I hope Mark is listening. I gave Christine a complete history of the breakers, including the great hall particulars, number of rooms, dates, et cetera. She was sweet and thankful. And I take full responsibility for her performance in the Gilded Age. <laughs> if you were to ask our special events director, Phil Pelletier, which house performed the best as a part of uh, the production, he would say the Elms. Here is the Elms kitchen before. And here's the Elms Kitchen during. I don't think that our collections team would agree with him, but this certainly um, was an incredible feat where taking a Newport kitchen to create a New York scene was truly transformative. Uh, the level of detail required in filming on these various sites was as intensive and involved as you can imagine. Um, and there were still moments of peace. This is a scene, or I should say <laughs> our own personal scene of the crew uh, after filming and wrapping season one at Hunter House. This is looking out over the harbor uh, from the um, from the Hunter House back lawn. There was also moments of chaos in which uh, we as museum professionals wanted to make it known that it was not okay to touch. <laughs> While we certainly turned some places upside down, we also saw opportunities to include chances, that included chances to examine and inventory important spaces. And this, this continued into season two filming. So a bit of a preview here. Uh, we were very excited to introduce new spaces, both exterior and interior. So this is King's Coat, which special secret will be in season two, as well as the interior of King's Coat completely emptied out, which we're not sure when the last time was that took place. Still a lot of yellow tape. So we're excited to show um, all of the various aspects of what it, it means to put on a production like this, how we had to work in tandem with really talented individuals from Hollywood and those here in Newport as well. Um, some There were some great moments of triumph and design. It's Sorry, it was a bad video. I didn't realize that until later. But um, we are excited to show you what will happen in season two, who will be in season two, and what will be coming to a TV near you. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists. First, we will have Laura Vulks, is chair of the curatorial department at the Hudson River Museum, where she has worked in various capacities since 1985. She holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a BA in art history from the University of Virginia. During her time at the Hudson River Museum, Laura has completed numerous successful furnishing, conservation, and interpretation projects for Glenview, the museum's 1877 Hudson River home on the National Register of Historic Places. She was a critical team member of a $2.1 million restoration project completed in 1999, which furnished the parlor and reopened it as a period room for the very first time. She has curated and written for numerous Hudson River Museum publications. Uh, then we will be graced with Emma Gen <laughs> Gen Corelli, excuse me, Emma. <laughs> uh, she is the film photography and collections coordinator at Lindhurst in Terrytown, New York, and she holds a BFA in film and worked in post-production on television programs and films for several years. In her current position, she combines her film experience with her MA in historic preservation and museum studies. What a catch you were for filming. 
um, which he received from the University of Delaware, um, integrating curatorial collections and research work side by side with the management and logistics for Lyndhurst film and television productions. And then last but not least, Catherine Sheehan, who is a native of Troy, New York, and has been a historian for Rensselaer County and Troy since 2006. Catherine has worked at the Hart Cluett Museum since 1986, arriving as an intern from the Public History Department at the University of Albany. She has lectured on topics including Uncle Sam, the Underground Railroad, women's suffrage, and most recently, of course, the Gilded Age in Troy, New York. She has appeared on numerous local and national television programs, including the History Channel, PBS, and C-SPAN. Catherine is currently finishing her research for a book to be published in 2023 titled Architecture Worth Saving in Rensselaer County 50 Years Later. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Laura. Thank you. This good? Great. So first of all, I am so honored to be here with my colleagues from Lyndhurst and the city of Troy and the Preservation Society of Newport to talk about our experiences film sites on the Gilded Age. I wanna thank the Preservation Society of Newport County for inviting me. And I especially wanna thank Jillian Fellows, Bob Shaw, Laurie Pictus, Nick DeWitt, and of course, HBO for their commitment to filming at historic sites. Glenview, part of the Hudson River Museum campus in Yonkers, New York, served as the interior for an actual historical person's home, Mrs. Astor, played by Donna Murphy. The wonderful photo on the right here is of Olive Thomas, part of our Yonkers digital archive, and I'll tell you more about that later. Now, this is a view of Glenview's Great Hall, where some of the Gilded Age sites were filmed. In the time I have, I want to give you a brief overview of three points. What makes Glenview special as an example of early Gilded Age decor? And that's an important distinction sitting in this room. How appearing on the Gilded Age TV show benefited the museum and how the work we're doing at the museum to expand the narrative is supported by the Gilded Age's storylines. This is the library where some of the other scenes were filmed. Glenview represents a very special moment at the beginning of the Gilded Age. It was built from 1876 to 1877, only a few years after Mark Twain coined the phrase in the novel he wrote with Charles Dudley Warner, The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today. We have six period rooms on view that exemplify this moment. The English taste called East Lake style, which took hold largely due to the influence of displays at the Centennial Exhibit in Philadelphia in 1876. Here are two shots in the Ebony Library showing Amy Forsyth, who played Mrs. Astor's daughter, Carrie. Behind Carrie, you see through the great hall and into the parlor. At the right is the key scene where Mrs. Astor throws Mrs. Russell's invitation into the fire. Now, that was a spoiler if you haven't seen season one. And that fire, I hope my colleagues appreciate, is definitely CGI. Now, um, I want just to also note that their fabulous costumes are by Kasha Willika Maimon. The early Gilded Age style of Glenview made it perfect for the home of Mrs. Astor uh, because she was the keeper of the 400 and that was the old regime in contrast to Mrs. Russell and the new French decor um, and the scenes between Mrs. Astor and her real life social advisor Ward McAllister played by Nathan Lane also took place in this room. Glenview is of a similar vintage to Chateau sur Mer here in, here in Newport, one of the first houses built where many scenes were also filmed. I think almost every room in the house I've heard. Now the facade of Mrs. Astor's house was filmed in Troy, but I wanna give you a sense of the Glenview's exterior architecture and our beautiful setting on the Hudson River, which is a national historic landmark district. Charles W. Clinton designed the house for the John Bon Trevor family just before his work on the 7th Regiment Armory in New York City, which also features a central tower like this. Some of you may have been to art fairs at the 7th Regiment Armory. Glenview sat on nearly 25 acres and resident gardeners kept the grounds landscaped and helped Mr. and Mrs. Trevor cultivate prize-winning flowers. Here we see John Trevor photographed around 1870, the year he married his second wife, Emily Norwood Trevor. The studio photo at the right is their young son, John Bond Jr. 
John Trevor was a banker with offices at 40 Wall Street. So he was in within commuting district on Vanderbilt's own railroad and the first Grand Central Terminal. The Trevor daughters, Mary Talmadge and Emily Howell loved Glenview, which they called their you know, the country, being in the country. And uh, below you see the two of them as children in a pony carriage on the grounds. And upper right is the grown-up Mary who married into the old Winthrop, uh, you know, New England money. And also Emily, as grown a woman, is picnicking on the Glenview grounds with Mary's daughters in the other photo. Now, I said Glenview was built during the centennial. The interiors of the house represent a very early Gilded Age moment, heavily influenced by English interior decoration. In fact, Charles Clinton displayed a house for a Yonk uh, from Yonkers at the Centennial, and that would have been Glenview under uh, construction at the time. Now, on the left is a fireplace overmantel that Howard and Sons displayed at the Centennial, and it was featured in Harper's Weekly. And on the right is a view into the Glenview uh, Library, and you can see a very similar fireplace. And then on the, the very right of the picture is the sitting room, and you can see some carved panels similar to what Howard and Sons displayed. Now, one of our prized possessions is a painting by Annalia Merritt titled The Patrician Mother, and it won a gold medal at the Centennial. Soon afterwards, the Trevors bought it, and it hung in the parlor at Glenview. When we restored the parlor in 1999, the painting was hung in its original place of honor. That was a really emotional moment for me. The woodwork at Glenview is spectacular and largely intact. Daniel Pabst of Philadelphia created the mantles, wainscoting, and a grand staircase with carved floral banisters and more. He and his cabinet makers were German immigrants, just one example of many stories to be told in one house. Pabst won a medal for a sideboard at the Centennial, which certainly attracted the attention of Clinton and Trevor. And this is a detail of our sideboard. He copied Aesop's fable designs from Eastlake's book, Hints on Household Taste, which you see the title page and then the design that he copied. And that's really important evidence that American designers were well aware of this English publication. Now, I want to quickly show you some of the details that make Glenview so beloved by us and our visitors. The hall staircase, which I mentioned before and used for several scenes in the show, is truly grand, looking up four floors to a painted laylight. I mentioned before the beautiful woodwork by Pabst. Here you see a detail of the walnut uh, newel post in the hall, a marker tree panel on the Ebony Library fireplace, and a maple cabinet panel in the sitting room, the same one you saw in the black and white photograph. All of this stylized floral decoration is very in keeping with the East Lake aesthetic. The house is filled with many types of beautiful original tiles, including ma encaustic tile floors, mint and transfer where fairy tale tiles in the great hall. This is uh, Beauty and the Beast. All of these tiles were from England because this was so new of an aesthetic in the US, they weren't you know, making them here yet. And also on the right is Guinevere by Daniel Cottier in the same fireplace. And he was a Scottish artist who had set up shop in New York. And Glenview, Glenview featured stencil ceilings by Leisner and Lewis who became one of the earliest full service interior decorating firms. And the museum began researching and recreating these in the 1970s. And that's the library on the right. Now in 1999, as, as you heard, I worked on the parlor and I collaborated with Felix Chavez and his amazing artists in recreating the parlor stencils seen center and left. These 1886 images of the house were taken by Edward Bierstadt for a book called Homes on the Hudson. His choice of Glenview is a testament to people's admiration for the house at the time it was first built and decorated. Edward was the brother of the Hudson River School painter, Albert Bierstadt, and both are currently the subject of an exhibition we have at the museum. Now, that's enough about Glenview's particular beauty and moment. Of course, I'm here also to talk about appearing in such a high quality television production. The premise of the Gilded Age series made for a special relationship with filming sites because we're all interpreting the same period. It's not the same as being in some other kind of film shoot that, you know, is not related to the house. 
The prestige of being selected provides more visibility on a national and international stage than we could achieve in any other way. Many visitors who come to our on-site or online Glenview programs mention the television show and that it piqued their interest. In addition to giving us unprecedented visibility, I believe that filming at sites like Glenview and the other historic properties adds authenticity that people appreciate, and that includes the stars. On Instagram, Donna Murphy posted this photograph of herself on our stair landing with her prop portrait. Usually we have uh, Mrs. Samuel Untermar by James Dubusa Shannon hanging there. As just one example of the amazing coverage we're getting, uh, connected to the show, we were cited in USA Today last week, along with Lynn Hurst and Troy as must-see Gilded Age attractions. And on the right, uh, you see again, uh, Louisa Jacobson as Marion Brooke and Cynthia Nixon as Ada Brooke. And that is, of course, the Van Ryn house. And we're on the left. Since appearing in the Gilded Age, our tours have been frequently sold out. And there's consistent demand for other types of programming, such as concerts and plays. And here in the large photograph is a book reading by WCBS anchor Mary Calvey, author of Dear George, Dear Mary, a novel of George Washington's first love. The moderator on the right is our director and CEO, Masha Turchinsky. I want to close by talking about our efforts to expand the narrative. In this photograph of Glenview's sitting room, painted portraits of the Lilienthal family of Yonkers are juxtaposed with early 20th century portraits printed and framed from our Yonkers digital photo archive. On the left are Olive on Arthur Thomas with their baby Lionel and another photo of Olive, which you saw on our title slide. On the right are childhood portraits of John Morgan and May Morgan Robinson. Film and TV bring the past to life. They create interest in real people and real places. The character of Peggy Scott in The Gilded Age inspires me and all of our museum staff because she exemplifies stories we are trying to tell in Yonkers. Here's a picture of Danae Benton who plays Peggy. She posted this on her Instagram with posing with her fictional parents played by Audra McDonald and John Douglas Thompson. We have been researching African-Americans from the same period in Yonkers. During the Gilded Age, Yonkers was a growing city with a diverse population, and there are many stories that can still be told. Here's a closer look at the image of May Morgan Robinson from our Yonkers digital photo archive, which we started in 2018. Christian Stegall, who served as our Samuel H. Cress Foundation Fellow, spearheaded the first phase of this project. And the goal was to ask African-American members of the Yonkers community to let us scan photographs that represented milestones and memories that were important to their families and Yonkers history. He collected over 700 images, including ones dating back to the 20, early 20th century. May Morgan Robinson grew up to become a leading civil rights advocate in Yonkers. She helped coordinate a trip of 200 Yonkers and New York City residents to the historic 1963 March on Washington. We're continuing to catalog and research these images and plan for their use in exhibitions and Glenview displays. Another exciting way we invite visitors to connect with Glenview is through artist interventions. On the left, you see Jennifer Angus in her 2018 Great Hall installation, Dying of Curiosity. She used preserved insects arranged in elaborate patterns to reflect the designs in Glenview and the Victorian obsession with scientific classification. Hanging contemporary artwork in a 19th century home offers opportunities to start meaningful conversations about universal themes and to consider the definition of home relative to identity, family, and belonging. On the right is Jamel Robinson in Glenview with his painting titled Home. In 2021, Jamel was our teaching artist in residence during the traveling show African American Art in the 20th Century, which came to the museum from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. As part of his companion exhibition, we asked him if he would like to hang this painting in the Great Hall and comment what it meant to him to be in this context. Referencing the digital collections I just showed you, Jamel said, 
This painting, along with these photographs of Black families in Yonkers, commands space that was not intended for our occupancy outside of labor. Its presence becomes a nod to our progress while illustrating the need for that progress in the first place. Now, Jamel is also a poet, and we included a QR code on the label linking to a performance of one of his poems called Home. The poem's also called Home. Twelve lines in, he said, Home is a stone throw away, a glass mansion in the lake of a fiery mind once caged, a chandelier promise of fate that hangs in the imbalance of power like a porcelain slave. I think that's an appropriate conclusion, because at the Hudson River Museum, we believe that our historic preservation stewardship takes many forms. Wealthy people's houses did not and do not exist in a vacuum without laborers that built them, staff that ran them, and a diverse network of surrounding communities over many, many years. The visibility granted to us by appearing in the Gilded Age has made a whole range of people interested in Glenview, and we are embracing the challenge at this moment. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's really nice to be here. So uh, good evening and thanks to the Preservation Society for inviting me and for having such a great panel to be with. Um, so we are going to get started. Lyndhurst is a 67 acre estate located on the eastern side of the Hudson River, just north of New York City. We are a National Historic Landmark and a Historic House Museum stewarded by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The estate has 15 individual buildings on the property, including two gatehouses, a former kennel slash boarding house, a bowling alley, a pool building, a greenhouse, a laundry building, carriage houses, a staff cottage, and of course our main attraction, the 1842 Gothic Revival Mansion. Like many historic sites, we offer tours, special events, and unique programming during our open season. Amidst all this, we somehow find the time to host film and television productions, Notably, we've been the location for the original Dark Shadows movies from the early 70s, a variety of feature films such as A Winter's Tale, his History Channel shows, an HGTV reality series, and a smattering of cable TV productions like The Blacklist, Saturday Night Live, and Prodigal Son. Kind of a lot. <laughs> Typically, we can have one to three individual productions a year, so we are always busy. But we're gonna begin with some history. General William Paulding Jr. was a former mayor, two-term mayor of New York City. He commissioned young architect Alexander Jackson Davis, the forefather of romantic architecture, to build him a summer retirement villa. It was constructed between 1838 and 1842 and prom featured prominently on a hill overlooking the Hudson River. Paulding aptly named it Knoll and was in residence until the 1850s. Contemporaries at the time called it a folly for its odd and fanciful as asymmetry and its pointed style. In a time dominated by classical revival architectural styles, Gothic revival architecture was a fanciful departure from what was popular. Second owner, George Merritt, purchases the home and decides to live in it full time in the mid 1860s. Bringing back the original architect, A.J. Davis, he adds a section to the north side of the house that contains a bigger dining room, more library space, and additional bedrooms. He also rearranges some of the rooms. The former dining room becomes a library. The second floor library becomes an art gallery and billiard room. Many of Paulding's interior decorations and finishes are also updated. Merritt develops the grounds as well by adding buildings, extensive plantings and trees to create a park-like landscape. He renames the house Lindenhurst for the linden trees adjacent to the mansion. The Merritt family are in residence until the late 1870s. Our third owner is perhaps our most famous financier, railroad tycoon, and mastermind of Wall Street, Jay Gould. He officially takes up residence in 1880 and looking to add to his growing portfolio a country retreat for himself and his family to enjoy away from the hustle of New York City. It is he who shortens the estate's name to Lindhurst. By this point in his life and career, Gould was a notoriously well-known persona in business, making a name and a fortune for himself through his swift and cutthroat tactics on Wall Street. For as big as his presence was in finance and business, Gould was the opposite in his personal life. He was famously quiet and reserved. 
He was a devoted and doting family man and husband, having never taken a mistress and was always home by dinner. He loved flowers and reading and he did not drink. He was attuned to Gilded Age society, but had no interest in it. His guiltiest pleasures were his family and the orchids in his greenhouse. His wife, Helen Day Gould, shared her husband's propensity for a quieter existence and was not a social climber, although her husband's standing in society did give her anxiety if only on behalf of her children. Lindhurst is special for a variety of reasons, but as a museum and historic site, we are fortunate to have an extensive record of what the house looked like and what it contained. We retain much of the original furnishings from each of our owners, including one of a kind furniture designed by the arch architects specifically for the house. Gould would fold these pieces in with his own additions and redesigns. He filled the art gallery with his own carefully chosen collection of paintings, and he had noted Gilded Age furniture makers, the Herder brothers, redesign the parlor. Largely though, he did not make huge adjustments to the house. You can see here in this photo from Gould's period of ownership, the Davis designed Gothic dining set in the Lindhurst dining room. All that was updated was the wall coverings. And what was once the Paulding dining room became the Gould library with Gould's extensive collection filling all the bookcases and folio cabinets. He had to add more cases to fit them all. The house you see in the Gilded Age while belonging to a character is still wholly recognizable as Lindhurst because of these iconic spaces. It goes without saying that having a television series solely about the most prominent part of our history was kind of exciting. Having them come to scout us and ultimately decide to utilize us felt like a dream come true. But it also meant that there was a lot of work for the Lindhurst curatorial staff to take on before the arrival of production. We worked closely with production design to identify what furniture and decor would be removed from the set and put into storage and what period appropriate items would remain. Many of, of our historic photos were helpful in identifying items that could and could not be used. Staff also had to identify all usable spaces and what was off limits. What could be talent holding and where would equipment be stored? A film crew has the uncanny ability to spread out into every available inch of space. And with so many historic features that Lindhurst exposed, we needed to protect the mansion while also making it accessible so the crew could get their job done. As I'm sure you're all aware, if you've seen season one, that the mansion interiors are the Fane household in the Gilded Age. On the second floor, our art gallery was the location of the Clara Barton Red Cross meetings. Our dining room was the scene of two luncheons, one with Mrs. Astor of Glenview um, and one with Ward McAllister. Our library became the Fane parlor and our entry hall, hallways and other rooms can be seen and recognized in the deep background. Today, Lindhurst is 181 years old and has the right amount of wear and tear visible on its surfaces. For the show, which takes place in 1882, the house must represent something that is much newer. That meant that once we'd emptied our rooms, the preparation days began with production scenic department who went to work to fix our scratches, scrapes, cracks, and hide all instances of modernity. But we do not make light of the work and skills and recognize the amazing care and concern that they undertook on this preservation work. And they truly made us sparkle. While the scenic department is at work, the set dressing crew gets started by installing protections on our delicate surfaces in preparation for all the equipment and eventually the full shooting crew. Then the electric and rigging crew arrives to get to work identifying where to use natural versus artificial light, where to run cables that will reach the generators outside and how to hide it all from the camera. Simultaneously, set dressers begin to build the sets. Specifically selected furniture comes in and once familiar rooms will suddenly take on a whole new look. In our art gallery, we worked closely with the dressers to take down our massive historic paintings and hang additional ones on the large picture window, much like what was there historically. In the library, elaborate window dressings were installed, books were rearranged in our cases and the bas relief over the fireplace became a landscape painting with some ingenuity. Electricians replaced our modern bulbs with those that better reflected the color and brightness of gas lamps. For the first time, we got to experience Lindhurst in the glow of a light not seen in a hundred years. We watched our rooms transform before our very eyes from our house to someone else's home. Before you know it, the shooting crew arrives. For those unfamiliar, it's a chaotic but professional and well-oiled machine. Everyone knows what they need to do and they do it. Filming days are long and Lindhurst staff are there to meet the crew early in the morning and see them off at the end of the day. We are the first on site, and the last to go home. 
we almost we also almost become part of the crew, assisting in the props team if one of our items being used on set needed to be moved, or helping camera if part of the house needs to be adjusted like shutters. We continue to keep a keen eye out to be sure that protections stay in place, that the crew are not edging into off-limits areas, and to answer any other questions that may arrive as they film their shots. Being just off set and behind the cameras means we also get to see the exciting parts of filming but also chat with the crew and the extras and occasionally meet the talent. We usually don't have this much activity in the mansion and despite how busy everyone is, they do find the time to ask about where they are and many of them come back to visit us. The mansion itself comes to life in a new way with every swish of a bustle, flourish of a gloved hand and clinking of silver on China become natural to the normally quiet rooms. Having these fictional and historic characters in our midst is the closest we will experience Lindhurst and its history as it might have been. The mansion wasn't the only location used at Lindhurst, though. Our upper lawn became the series' opening sequence, with production building a massive dirt road, dirt path, dirt road, same thing, across the grass for wagons, horses, and sheep. Our greenhouse became the backdrop of multiple carriage ride scenes. To account for its unfinished state, production built a scaffold to portray it as a newly constructed as the characters rode by. Our lawns and plantings of historic trees easily doubled for Central Park and many of the walking and talking scenes between the characters. And our 1894 bowling alley became the architectural basis for the ferry terminal in the first episode. This is a blink and you'll miss it, but it's kind of exciting for us. Production crew measured and photographed the building and then rebuilt their structure on their back lot so that it could be amended by visual effects and a plethora of extras. But perhaps the most transformative set we have hosted was in our carriage house. What was originally a plain beadboard clad room for dressing horses and tack became the New York Globe newspaper offices. As much as we've enjoyed the guilt and glamour in the sets of the mansion, the New York Globe offices truly astounded us as it was something unlike anything we have at Lyndhurst. The scenic department here first darkened our floors and set dressers prepared for the arrival of the furniture and printing presses. Marking out the furniture with tape on the floor allowed them to plan and arrange the room without having to deal with moving and removing the dangerously heavy machines. The printing presses and other print shop equipment had to be loaded in first. The International Print Museum in Los Angeles provided the period print shop items to the production, and their staff worked in tandem with the crew to get the machinery placed in one go with kind of not a lot of room to spare. With Once the heaviest pieces were in place, everything else for the newspaper office was built around it, including an entry vestibule, railings, new lighting, and appropriate floor scuffs. The mansion may have been recognizable, but our carriage house was not once they were finished. It was a very dynamic space to experience, and as the print museum staff stayed on to assist with running of the presses for filming, I had the opportunity to run the printing press myself. So while we can offer our expertise, uh, once in a while we do also get to you know, have fun and learn some tricks. <laughs> Filming these scenes spilled out onto the lawns and meant a flurry of activity and a horde of extras, horses and wagons and equipment. The likes that our carriage house hadn't seen in a long time. It almost looks like it's supposed to be that way, which is the best part. Filming the series at Lindhurst has provided us the opportunity to interpret history in a much more visual and complete way. Those who watch the series can gain a better understanding of what things were like during the Gilded Age, including the histories tied to the New York Globe storyline. Lyndhurst's history does not include the Black Elite or a newspaper office, but our small part as the location for these characters and those scenes has allowed us to better understand that history and their stories. It was a privilege for us to be a part of a production that took the care and attention to research and portray these untold stories in an authentic way. We talked briefly about Lyndhurst owner Jay Gould and his undeniable presence in history as one of the most notorious figures in American financial history. We want to highlight the inspiration that the show derived from our former owner. While the characters are largely fictitious people, many are based in part on real individuals. George Russell is no exception, with portions of his narrative and character traits based on Gould. There are little pieces and touches that call back to his life and career, and you can catch glimmers of it when you watch him on screen as a ruthless businessman, devoted husband, and a caring father. 
George Russell may be inspired by Jay Gould, but also strangely enough, Jay Gould exists in the world of the Gilded Age in multiple ways. Episode four found George Russell himself lamenting Gould's strategic outmaneuvering of him regarding the Missouri Pacific Railroad. Despite the show's attention to accuracy, Jay's posthumous 1892 portrait hangs in the Lindhurst Art Gallery during the Red Cross scenes. As stewards of Lindhurst, we appreciate seeing him there, peering out over the cast as they recreate his world and pieces of his life story and his beloved house for all of us to watch and enjoy. And as we've seen before, we can confirm that season two was filmed this past spring at Lindhurst. Um, and while I can't say anything yet, um, I do want to wholeheartedly thank, if any of them are watching, uh, the production for their courteousness, uh, respect, and professionalism when they were um, on the property. It was completely, it was truly exemplary. Um, and you guys are really going to love season two. For sure. Like, I just promise you, you're going to love it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So I bring up the end. <laughs> I'm Kathy Sheehan, and uh, I too want to thank or my colleagues here from the Newport Preservation Society and, and Jim and Leslie. And, and uh, this has just been, we've had a ball in Troy and uh, it's a little bit different for us because we haven't had the, um, we haven't had the experience of really having them in the house much. Uh, we have our um, 1827 federal style townhouse. And it was it was this house uh, here that you see on, on second street that uh, I first met Bob Shaw probably five years ago. <laughs> and uh, he came in one Saturday afternoon and, you know, they're pretty quiet. And and I've been at the museum for 36 years and uh, 36 years ago, someone said they were coming in and filming. I would be, yes, how exciting, but you get a little jaded over the years because as you know, things never seem to go through with a lot of these films. So I didn't pay that much attention. And it wasn't until after it was the second or third visit, I think when they came in the third time and there was an entire busload of people <laughs> that came in the door and went, oh, Okay. And then they said, oh, this is a Julian Fellows production. I went, oh, okay. You know, now we it's Downton Abbey, of course. And um, so what, what was interesting uh, that they were looking at with Troy and what, what Bob loved about the city of Troy was um, certainly the architecture. And he said, you know, um, we need a range of buildings. We, you know, you have these amazing buildings that are, of course, this, this Gilded Age era, but to be able to do street scenes and to look to be outside, he said, you need to have a range of, you know, of these buildings that go from the 1820s up to the 1880s. And we were very fortunate to have that in Troy, New York. And um, he called it the anti-Beverly Hillbillies effect. If you all remember that show um, where, you know, it's a very tight shot and you see them all come out and you know, granny waving and everything. He said, he said, you don't see anything behind that because that was a set. He said, I want people to be able to walk and talk going up and down the street. And if you remember from season one, we have several of those kinds of scenes that um, I'll show you. Uh, so this house is our, is our 1827 house. And um, the one scene that we did uh, have coming in is, um, it'll, I'll show it to you at the end, but uh, they do come into the wonderful, uh, through the double fan light doorway. Um, and this was designed by New York City architect, Martin Euclid Thompson. And he created this as a prototype house and then took it back down to New York City where they were built by the droves most of which don't even exist anymore. Um, as you know, if anybody's been around in Manhattan, uh, the Merchant House Museum would be another wonderful example of that. And so um, it was this wonderful young couple. And, and uh, we think of the old money and new money uh, here in Troy. And uh, Richard and Betsy Hart represented the old money. Uh, Richard came up from Dutchess County and really uh, came into Troy at a time when the Erie Canal is being established. He invests, he's one of the investors in the railroad roads and, and uh, turnpikes and um, all that kind of infrastructure. Uh, we are up at the headwaters of the Hudson River. And so um, his one of his partners was a man by the name of William Howard. And William Howard's daughter is Betsy Amelia Howard. And uh, they actually grew up on, uh, she actually grew up on Day Street or Dye Street down in New York City, right where the World Trade Center was located. Uh, so Betsy became Richard's third wife. His first two um, died, his first two wives died on childbirth. Third time was charm. They had 14 children. I know. 
13 of which grew up to be adults, which was really pretty amazing in the 19th century. Um, and they also did come out here to Newport. Before all these mansions were here, there were some smaller hotels and things, and they would come out here for the summer. So they, they knew how to escape um, the city as well. And so this house is built. Uh, William uh, has this house built. It's 27 rooms. And, uh, you know, it's a wonderful example of this federal style townhouse. So again, back to what they were looking for for the Gilded Age are things like we need some great street scenes about five blocks south of, of um, the Historical Society. Our Cluet House is a wonderful uh, park called Washington Park. Uh, it was built a couple of years after Gramercy Park in New York City. So it's really that kind of contemporary. And uh, the you see the image on the left. Uh, that is Washington Place, which was the first row of buildings, very much in the English style. Julian Fellows loved that when he came here. Um, we got to have a lovely chat, the two of us walking down in front of that. And of course, what you see, uh, they really use that a lot for these long street scenes. Um, there is Marion and Peggy uh, walking into walking into the park. Uh, if you remember all the scenes where Oscar is also hopping out of his, his coach to run inside. And the beauty of this is that it is an amazing intact. Um, that is not fake Belgian block or cobblestone that's down there. That is real. Uh, and it was actually restored about 10 years ago. And so all they had to do was take a couple of air conditioners out. Um, the set designers were just thrilled <laughs> to be in Troy. They went, wow, you guys really made this easy for us. And the fact that it's in its own historic district as part of a greater um, uh, historic district in Troy uh, also made that easy because we already had the gas lights in place. And uh, so again, it was just a, a really very, it's very symbiotic for all of us to be here. And uh, so all we saw is coaches and you see them going up and down um, the street. Uh, now, our other Gilded Age era, we have, this is the home of um, John Augustus Griswold. And John makes his money uh, in the, uh, by um, having the Troy and Rensselaer uh, ironworks and uh, he is the person who is responsible for the signing of the contract for the building of the monitor and that famous ironclad uh, battle with the monitor and the Merrimack. So he makes that money and it doesn't hurt that he also inherits a little bit of old family money by Mary and Betsy and Richard Hart's daughter, Elizabeth. And so they have this amazing house also on Washington Park. And um, this exterior is used, you will see it in season two, it wasn't in season one, but you will see this in season two. And um, the, we have the A.J. Davis uh, little Gothic front uh, that he he was here in, in town as well, um, as well as down at Lindhurst. And what I wish is that like this beautiful room that we are in tonight, I wish we could have colorized this photograph because there's accounts of, you know, beautiful rose colored carpeting and the beautiful tooled leather up, up on the on the ceiling and things like that. Um, and gas lighting. Uh, Bessie Hart actually was one of the first investors in our Troy Gaslight Company. So the area around Washington Park was uh, in, installed. The other area that they filmed a great deal of uh, is, and these street scenes, is in what is now our Monument Square. Uh, but at the time, uh, it'd be in the 1880s, and this is right around 18. 90 when this is taken. Um, this was called Washington Square, of course, named after George. And the wonderful building you see on the left, uh, our Cannon building actually dates back to 1835. And it too was designed by Alexander Jackson Davis. Um, and it was, of course, when he was with the firm of, of Davis, Ithiel Town, and uh, James Dakin. And uh, it is still one of the oldest commercially operated buildings in the country. The very kind of sick looking tree, um, you'll see in a minute, it turns into a, a wonderful monument at, at some point in 1891. And so this became the center. And this was the center for the main scene uh, that was done, the lighting of Edison's, uh, the uh, of lighting of the Times building. And of course, you know, Mr. Edison's um, invention. And so if you look at the image on the right, uh, that was uh, 1891 when the um, monument was dedicated. This is our Soldiers and Sailors Monument. And there were almost 10,000 people there. So they had to figure out how are we going to get that look um, in, into the same thing. Now you can see the monument on the left. The, edit, the um, Times building is actually green screened, but the buildings on the right, you see that wonderful arch, um, that is our McCarthy building. And if you look right, and I apologize, so HB, you know, I, we loved HBO, we loved working with the crew, but they don't give anything away for images, you know, it's hard to, <laughs> and this was a tough one because 
it was really dark. <laughs> and so you took, I really had to kind of just screenshot this off of my, um, off my laptop. But um, this was a wonderful scene. Uh, and uh, you remember um, Bertha Russell is in the carriage with, with Nathan Lane and they're all in the coaches sitting in front of that. That was her last night of filming. And she loved being in Troy. She said, you know, we're all used to using green screens um, as actors. She said, but to have all these other buildings around and they bought all these electricians in to not only light up the green screen there, but to backlight and to light up all the other buildings around the Cannon building and, and the McCarthy building and around the monument. And she said, we legitimately got so excited. I don't know if you remember that scene when, and you see um, Peggy and, and uh, the owner of the globe, the whole, everyone's standing there and you see, they're all fascinated. And she said, that was legit. She said, we were really, truly excited to have this kind of happen. Of course, they were there all night long. She also, by the way, was nine months pregnant for her son. There was no, <laughs> so they had to pull the tables up over the coaches. You know, there was no disguising this anymore. Um, here is, this is the wonderful building that now becomes Bloomingdale's um, in the in the scene. If you remember that scene, you see Peggy and Marion, they actually walk out from a block away and they're talking and walking and talking and walking um, all the way down. And here they are going into uh, the left side of the Cannon building. And uh, then you have that great scene where they see Mrs. Chamberlain and those wonderful cases that you see in there, uh, the Rosewood cases, that is not props. Um, this became a, a, a jewelry store for almost 100 years. And all those, those beautiful Rosewood cases are still in there, as well as I'm so glad they didn't hide. There's a wonderful mural that was done by a, a young woman, Liz, Isabel Lusty Sim, who would have been a kind of a counter, real counterpart to uh, Marion. So all, all they do is bring in the little props um, to, to set that up. But um, this this is our this is our version of Bloomingdale's in New York. You know, again, he was really thrilled to do that. And of course, our really wonderful, um, our really showcase piece of architecture in Troy. This is our Troy Savings Bank Music Hall, uh, designed by George B. Post in 1875. And uh, there are two scenes that are done. The first. The first scene where, you know, Mrs. Rain is in charge of now bringing Bertha Russell into the fold, so to speak. And so they bring her to the concert. And that is where Marion um, sees Mr. Rain. And uh, for the first time, and then, of course, the last time, again, is the scene with Mrs. Rain. Um, is there anybody that didn't see that? Because I just want you to know I went on the record. First thing, Mr. Rain. <laughs> rakes, not Mr. Rain, the rakes. Nope. <laughs> So we also had a Gilded Age, uh, a couple, right? this kind of real life, uh, life imitating art, so to speak. Um, this is George and Amanda Cluett. And George Cluett comes from Birmingham, England in the 1850s with his eight brothers and sisters and his parents. Uh, most of the family went into the music and book bind binding business, but George gets this crazy idea and he goes into the collar business. And of course, what he invents, of course, is the arrow collars. And it really epitomizes the white collar worker. Uh, they became the largest employers, almost 10,000 women alone worked in the Troy factories. Um, they also ended up extending factories all over the place. And of course, they have this amazing artist, J.C. Liondecker, um, who does the, the epitome of the um, Arrow Man. Um, here is the other half. We talk about the Gilded Ages with haves and haves nots. Well, here's the 10,000 women um, stuffed in this factory. Um, we do produce the first successful collar laundresses union, came out of Troy, done by Kate Mullaney. And um, she was able to get better wages and, and somewhat shorter hours, although that went for, for quite a long time. Uh, one of our favorite scenes that happened too, this is again, Washington Park. They use Washington Park a lot. And uh, this is the scene where uh, Mr. Rakes is trying to figure out how he can meet up with Marion. And so they are going pr presumably to Bryant Park. So this is taking the place of Bryant Park where they had the statue, the pieces of the Statue of Liberty hanging up there. And so they were, what they loved, again, and what Bob was always talking about, he goes, we can put this camera on one end of the park, it takes a full city block, and shoot right through there, and nothing else is going to be a problem, except, like I said, take a couple air conditioners out the window, because the park is so, was really, is, is so amazing, you'll have to come up to Troy to see it. Um, they also, on the third street side of the park, um, they were able to turn that into Brooklyn. And so this is Peggy's parents' house. And um, they use that for season one and season two. Um, there's a scene, of course, that horror, you know, awful scene where Marion comes in with the with the uh, with the um, the the boots 
you know, that she's bringing in. And uh, this is the Comiskey's house. I know they're watching tonight. And uh, they used interiors as well. And that is going to be used for season two. So it was really wonderful. All they really kind of do is shift the cameras around a little bit. One minute we're in Manhattan. Next minute you're over here in Brooklyn. And uh, it was it was really terrific. Um, last but not least, this is the exterior of Mrs. Rain's house. Uh, now, they use Lindhurst for the interiors, but this is the Payne uh, Mansion, and it's two doors up from our museum. And uh, they use there, there you can see Marion and, and Peggy outside. And uh, that's when they had the scene, they stand up with um, with, with uh, Claire Barton when she comes in. It's also the scene uh, where they have this wonderful street scene and the coachman that comes in, or the um, cab driver that won't pick up uh, Marion and Peggy because Marion is standing there as a young black woman. And uh, what was kind of interesting is that as they were filming, you can't hear what they're saying. So it was really interesting to see, it's like, what's going on with this, this thing? Because there were a couple of times it's like, why is Marion hailing the cab when there's a coachman right there? And I know they had to try and work this in into the story. Um, I was not happy about that, but that's okay. <laughs> about her hailing, not about the storyline was great. Um, so it was kind of fun because now once you see this, they're like, oh, this is what they're all talking about. And certainly last but not least, this is our heart. This is the exterior of our heart clue house. This is the scene just before the ballroom. So this is our cliffhanger for season one. And there is our, our federal style townhouse. The director loved the, the, um, the wonderful, um, uh, urns, the wrought iron urns that are out there. So he kept saying to the poor guys, shoot through the urns, shoot through the urns. And uh, they did lay down the, the fake cobblestone out there, which was really fun. And um, this is Mrs. Russell's, you know, her, her, um, one of the servants, he was watching her from across the street and she finally summons him over and she said, who are you? And he goes, don't you recognize me, Polly? And she says, no, who are you? And he goes, he said, I'm Collier. And she just books into the house. Um, that took a day and a half to film that, by the way. <laughs> um, but they were, the crew was uh, really uh, like, I, like our, my colleagues have been saying, we couldn't have been happier. And it was just amazing to see. Uh, and our the result of all this, our visitation is up 40%. Um, we have Gilded Age tours. I could do a Gilded Age tour every single solitary day. Every one of them is, is sold out within a day or two. Um, and we encompass a good 12 block area. So that's what they needed, all that wonderful architecture that is intact. So thank you and come visit us in Troy. <laughs> okay, thank you. I still have, okay, Mike's still on. Okay, we're gonna do a, a few group discussion points before we go into q and i I'm just gonna position myself over here. Fascinating from all different perspectives. It's it's quite quite extraordinary how everything comes together on screen, but behind the scenes, it's all such different experiences for us. And I, I wanted to start with a question about what is the most unexpected thing that you learned or happened as a part of your involvement with the production? And I'll let anybody jump in. That oops, revolve our mics on. No, there goes. I think that what happened for us is our local, the people who have lived in Troy their whole lives, who never came down to see our museum, all once showed up because they saw this on TV, and it has generated interest in history. Um, it became a catalyst for us. And again, that's why, you know, visitations increase, research requests have increased, people are interested now in their own homes and, you know, who was there. And um, so that's, that's been amazing for, from our, and from my perspective as a historian, I love that. Are you kidding? <laughs> I would say probably from the Preservation Society's perspective, it was extraordinary to see what sort of changes the production wanted to make within our homes, because we like to think of them as being pretty well preserved. But of course, in some places, electricity has been added. We've had to put in HVAC systems for um, climate control, et cetera. Uh, but in how they really wanted to take things back in very specific ways, uh, changing out lighting systems, um, the types of tablewares they wanted to introduce and making things again, as I pointed out at the beginning, Newport scenes look like New York scenes, mm -hmm. which is quite transformative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, we had some interesting cases where, you know, there's a modern like fire alarm pull on the wall or something, and they would make this beautiful decorative box to put on the wall to hide it that looked like it was 
part of the architecture or something like that. Um, it also fascinated me when they would be going for the details. There were a few scenes in our library where they had all these screens up to diffuse the light and do all these things. And, and nothing was left of the room except the furniture in the middle and, you know, the actress sitting there and, you know, Ward McAllister talking to Mrs. Astor and maybe, maybe you could see a little bit of the fireplace. So it, you know, it probably doesn't surprise you as much, Emma, because you're familiar with film, but they know so much what they're looking for. And they know that even though the whole room is obscured and that, that it's getting what they want. And that was really interesting to see. Yeah, no, with my background in film, unfortunately, I knew a little too much <laughs> going into it, except it, just for everyone's reference, those are called mystery boxes. So if you're watching a show and you see like weird, like look like spice boxes or weird things just on the wall, you're like, what is that? It's it's covering a light switch or a, a fire alarm pole or, you know, any variety of things that, you know, they don't want to see on camera. And we actually have a whole closet of them now because we kept them <laughs> for when they come back. So it's I actually kind of cool. The night scenes, I think those were things that we were really fascinated with because it's hard to get rid of all this modern ambient light. And they did an amazing job of, of, control you know trying to diffuse that not just at the the big scene in on monument square but the night scenes going up and down you know again this basically 12 block area and uh that was really cool i mean i don't know how they did that but <laughs> but it that rings a bell for us as well there were plenty of night scenes but what was also really fascinating was the covid procedures they had put in place mm -hmm. um production was supposed to begin and then of course the pandemic started so we pushed off our official filming uh, location schedule and then once we decided to, once everyone agreed to come back, um, they brought their own physicians, their own clinic, their own protocol. As a staff, we were all tested. If you're going to be working on site, it was one of the most organized operations I've ever been a part of in terms of healthcare. So I think we could, maybe I'll take a leave from how productions uh, put together their healthcare systems. Yeah, I think we had about 1,300 people, and out of the 1,300 was about 500 maybe that were actors and extras. The rest was all crew and they all had to get tested every day and right down to the Teamster truck drivers that were, you know, sitting by things and the guys with the horses. And yeah, they took a lot of space down. down. <laughs> Do we actually have any extras in the audience tonight? Oh, that's so oh, surprising. Wow. We had, there were so many great community members that came out and got to dress up as a part of the, uh, the background. So um, we hope to hear their stories as well at some point. Um, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced as a part of filming uh, in terms of, you know, as you discussed with Lindhurst, trying to protect the property and collections? Obviously, there are some things that weren't removed and some things that were added. Uh, were they structural? Were they props, lighting, um, things that you had to consider from your, your backgrounds as curators, historians, as well as film? Well, the biggest thing for us was that, you know, Lindhurst is not... I mean, we might, from the far end of the marble house to here, I think man, Lindhurst would probably fit in just this space. So we don't have a lot of storage. So it was like, oh, you want this whole floor emptied? Where are we going to put it? <laughs> Where are we going to put it all? And we have to play Tetris in our rooms. And like like you saw the, the pictures of um, Glenview with the tape, like we just had to put stuff in rooms and just kind of stack it and kind of hope everything would be okay and keep an eye on it. But like, like I said, they're, everyone's a professional. All their set dressers are most of them have been art handlers, so they all know how to carry everything properly. They would put protections on stuff, even packed away in closets. So it's just like for us, one of the biggest things is, is where are we going to put it? And if, oh, you want that table in the scene? Oh, great. That's <laughs> 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 a fun place to put it. Yeah, they really, I mean, they really had to know exactly what the scene was going to be because some of the things that we did with some of the furniture was we would think, well, we'll put it in this room because this room, like, isn't going to be in the scene. And then they'd be like, well, but we, we might have an angle, you know, when we go into that room. And I think in the parlor, like there's a scene where you see um, a footman like go over and do something on the mantle. And so we had that line clear. But I think over in the other part of the room, there was some furniture that had been taken out of one of the other rooms. They were like, you're sure, like you're really sure. And they did know, you know, like, okay, so we can put some stuff over there. Like I brought it up too, and I don't want to cut you off, but like, you, I don't think people realize how much comes into a room. Like if they were shooting in here, 
there'd be no shoulder space. Like there'd be between lights and scrims and C stands and monitors and extras and things like there, there'd be no room except for whatever the little boxes that they're shooting in. And then when they change angles for, you know, they shoot, let's say, you know, Oscar Van Ryn, and then now they got to shoot someone else. Like everything has to move. And it's like this amazing dance that they do where like everything's got to switch the other direction. And, you know, it takes 20 minutes, 30 minutes. There was tracks. Minutes. They had like rail, there's, there's tracks. Like, railroad it's just, tracks that they put the cameras on. It's not as easy as you think it would be. It's actually really complex. And that was like kind of interesting to watch them because they were such a dialed in machine that you're just like, no, I don't have to worry about it. They know they're not going to bump anything. We got it. They, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. Solid yeah. endorsements for HBO. <laughs> and for us, it was a little different in that real life is going on while they're filming on the street. So people still have to get in their houses. People, there's the wonderful courthouse scene um, with Mr. Russell. You know, the rest of the courthouse, things were still going on. Trials are still going on. People are still in the street. So it was kind of this, okay, if, just wait for two minutes. We're going to shoot the scene. And then you can walk by and take your dog and go, you know, home. <laughs> so it was that kind of, and I, I kind of spent a lot of time just talking to people outside. It's like, don't worry. It's not going to be a long time. And, you know, and, and people were fat. People were really pretty, really good about, it. there's always a couple of big complaint, but for the most part, people were excited. Like, oh, well, what are they doing now? What is going on here? You know? Um, so real life, you know, we weren't able, we weren't like, were you were either of you where you could close off people. We couldn't do that. <laughs> so they may close off a, a block, but you know, then they get done. Everybody go to the next block. So <laughs> that was that was the that was I think probably the challenging part for the crew. And again, they were amazing. They really were. Yeah. And so kind to to everyone. Oh yeah. Yeah. They really were. Absolutely. Well, I think um, in the conscious of time the situation, if we have any questions for our panelists, Claire's over here. She'll have the microphone. If you'd raise your hand. How hard was it to uh, to put everything back together again? Did they help you? Uh, did you use the opportunity to maybe make some changes uh, to what had been there before? I can say on behalf of the Preservation Society, yes and yes. <laughs> so our, our preparation time was about a month in advance. Um, while we have so many spaces to care for, we have a relatively thin staff. So we would coordinate together internally through various departments, removing pieces, um, and then also afterwards take that opportunity, such as at King's Coat, to really edit what went back into the spaces that really helped advance our tours and the narratives we were trying to share. Yeah, I would say our registrar and collection manager probably loved it because she got everything out and she was cleaning everything and, you know, every every bookcase, every, you know, it was really a magnificent opportunity to to spruce up the rooms and also in some of the rooms we we painted and we made some changes so you know yeah and it, and it gives you a different perspective i mean it, it's probably been a lot of years since you've seen one of those rooms completely empty so uh, you do get a chance to rethink it we had a lot of cleaning that got got done <laughs> after once they moved back out and we were starting to put things back we're like oh we should definitely clean this <laughs> let's, let's yeah. clean this while everything's out of the way and they did help us put things back um we definitely felt comfortable with them to especially with big heavy tables and stuff for then big statuary and things to to put them back so that we didn't have to um muddle through that ourselves windows got washed okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing these big windows it's a lot to get that done yeah yeah, but having all those lifts around was great. It's like, could you just go up to the balustrade here and <laughs> sweep out all of that in there? Yeah. And I would probably add that uh, in a two to three week span of filming, there was a week on the front end for production uh, prepping, a week on the back end for sort of the dismissal of objects. But then for our timeline, add two more weeks on either end. So a few weeks of filming for us was a month and a half of preparation and full time work. So some of our projects we had on in our, our view shed had to be put to the side. Uh, but in the end, again, there were great benefits to it, even though it, it changed some of our, our direction for our own projects. Anyone else? Uh, this question is actually specifically for Emma of Lindhurst. You mentioned that the house needs to look newer than it really is because of the period in which the, the show takes place. And you mentioned that they did some touch-ups. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, were these permanently, you know, covering a scuff mark or something like that or temporary? Yes. Um, so 
as a historic house with currently not an HVAC system, but a heating system and, you know, having to be shuttered for a lot of the time because of security reasons, um, it unfortunately doesn't breathe as much as it should and was meant to. So a lot of our rooms do have cracked paint, some plaster spots that are, you know, not so great, some old water leak places from years ago. And, you know, we do a lot of tours during the day. So a lot of the doors get dings and scrapes and stuff from people's bags and jackets. So, you know, you camera, the camera will find all of those spots. So, you know, for us, it's like, it makes sense to see those things, but you know, in 1882, this house was actually from, you know, it's a 40 year old house. So we shouldn't be seeing those things. So yes, they actually would go in and make these permanent repairs to the house, which was, you know, a boon for us because a lot of the times it's like, we'll paint it every season, you know, it'll, it'll crumble again, something will happen just because we don't have the time and the bandwidth to get in and do it. And they come in and they have really skilled artisans that honestly are preservationists. Um, when it comes down to it, they understand plaster. They know how to scrape and, you know, sand and paint something so that it'll actually take. And they fixed so many things for us. And like I said, our rooms just like, they took on a whole new life because they just looked so much better. And now you can see the, the room and not like, oh, there's a, <laughs> a little bit of a crack up there from an old water leak or, oh, there's something over there on that door where someone's bag probably caught it a couple of years ago. And it was just, like I said, we just, I, I glossed over it, but really I couldn't say enough for the scene yeah. department and really the care. And like, we have a lot of faux graining. They know how to do faux graining. So they would faux grain stuff for us that, you know, you can't find those people in preservation anymore. So I it's want like, that the, number. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, these are yeah. the people who could do it now. So it's like, bring a film production and they can probably do it. Yeah. <laughs> could be the art team was amazing. Oh, truly. I mean, even what you'll see in season two at, in Marble House, if you're here tonight, please take a chance uh, to look into the dining room. That Namibian marble, they had a, a production team faux grain columns that match it so perfectly. There was a, a bit of a clip in my early presentation, but it's extraordinary uh the kind of craftsmanship that they have yeah like at the head foreman for us um her name was uh i think it was i'm gonna say dana keys but it's dana k but she's like an amazing love you dana um you know uh what's what i want um theater production designer too so she like did sets for phantom of the opera but like she would text me and be like can i come back and check the paint swatch again can i come back and check the stain color so like it was just like they were they, they got so into helping us that like you know it was, by the end of it you know their family you can come back anytime <laughs> the reason bob shaw won that emmy <laughs> yes yes i think we had a question over here earlier yes I was so curious watching season one, which house was the the grand uh, entrance hall for the Russells in New York? CGI and studio. Yeah. It was all fake. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's it's one incredible. of our houses here. In, okay. Yeah. Hopefully they'll yeah. do a behind the scenes where like people can get a sense of the back lot that they built. So like that whole Fifth Avenue stuff with the Ryan Van Ryan's across from the Russells. Right entirely on a back lot yeah like it's it's amazing so it's, it's, down, down, it's down on beth page right? it's, an, it's incredible yeah. so yeah the interiors yeah. are all these sets well and even too um it's just the first story and a half mm -hmm. of the russell's facade that was actually built up the rest of it was all cgi right so it's it's really incredible they built part of the set and then used very talented mm -hmm. computer engineers and designers to recreate the rest of it one of the things they were talking about was that they want to have it dirty it up a little bit. They thought <laughs> that it was a little too clean. Uh, <laughs> I agree. The, the final scene of the final episode, you yeah. finally saw somebody yeah. picking up horse droppings on the street. Right. And I thought, when, when is that going to happen? Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, they're all over the place. <laughs> I think we'll have time for one more question, if that's all right. Okay. Well, no oh, questions. Right oh, right over there. here. Great. Hi, thank you for this. Was this good financially for the organizations? I mean, you're losing a lot of visitor traffic and um, I, I don't need to know the numbers, but. I mean, yeah, I can speak for the Preservation Society. Um, HBO is incredibly generous in terms of understanding what we would normally receive in terms of revenue from gate admissions and working with us to, to compensate us so we weren't losing money. Uh, and then also, as my colleagues have shared, there were several preservation projects that they themselves would pay for, which we would have loved to do in earlier times, but didn't have the um, financial means to do so. So all in all, I would say financially, yes, it was a great benefit for us. And even into the future post-production, it is, again, bringing in great tourism um, and visitation. Yeah. Each yeah. of the businesses were also compensated. That might have had to close, uh, particularly around that Monument Square area. Um, so they were all compensated. We were compensated place. They needed spaces for the extras to go into. 
Um, so they're they're all compensated as well. And like I said, our, our visitation is up 40%, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, one thing that hasn't been mentioned really is this was 2020, you know, mm -hmm. and for us, Glenview was actually closed during that time. So it wasn't that we were losing visitation to have the filming take place. It was really, really vital to us during that year to have the filming come because the museum had been closed for a while. And even when the museum reopened, we kept Glenview closed because it is not full of vast spaces like this. There are some pretty small spaces, you know, and, and you know, so so it was really amazing to to have them there and it was really helpful to the museum. Yeah, I'll just say I can, say I can echo that. It, like for 2021, we were already closed. So it was like, oh good, we can have you here for like an eight week stretch and a big run. And then it was a little trickier for season two because we were open and we actually, they came back in two big, two big chunks, which made it difficult for us to work around with visitation. So we'll have to see what it's like when hopefully season, season three comes. <laughs> <laughs> so again, stay tuned for season two, Diddy in April. I want to thank my panelists for joining me. This was so much fun. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you for everyone that's here this evening in person as well on Zoom. We really appreciate your support of the Preservation Society of Newport County, and we will see you at our next lecture in February. Well done. Bravo. Yes.